Hi, you're watching DNA Today, a multi-award winning genetics podcast where we explore everything to do with genetics from CRISPR to rare diseases to new research. We have won the Science in Medicine Podcast Award for many years now. We have hundreds of episodes, and we really hope you enjoy these conversations where we dive into so many genetic concepts. I'm Kira Deneen, a certified genetic counselor and your host. Hello, we are recording at NBC Universal Stanford Studios, and I am delighted to be here with a good friend of mine, Robert Biscacci, who is an author of a really good book that I was like, oh, let me start, and finished in one day. Um, it was a beautiful day. I was sitting on my patio, and I was like, oh, I'll just start this before dinner. I had a late dinner because the book was so good. So thank you so much, Rob, for coming on. We're going to be talking about computer vision and how we can utilize this to diagnose genetic conditions. So a very specific topic, but this is where our worlds collide, Rob. <laughs> it is, and thank you so much for having me on the show. It is an honor. I've uh, listened to the show in the past and enjoyed it, especially the Gattaca episode. Yes, um. which there's a little <laughs> disclaimer there. We have to say that your partner was on that episode, and that's how we got introduced. Um, so true. Catherine Mayo, shout out to my former roommate and one of my best friends. Um, we were uh, at Sarah Lawrence together, and now we're practicing as genetic counselors. Um, but about Rob, I see your career in, in two categories, one being in the digital post-production world, and you've worked for some really cool TV shows like Billion, some Netflix shows, and then the second part being your experience with working with data sets, machine learning, you know a lot more about AI than I do. I remember when I first heard about the term AI, I was like, Rob, tell me what the heck this is. <laughs> and it was that week that like I talked to you about it. Um, so I think it's really cool that you've been able to use all of that experience to write this book, The Spring of Sight, here. Um, and I even got an advanced reader copy, which I have to kind of say that was very nice of you to send me. And what's really cool is Rob has been generous enough to have a giveaway. So you're going to sign a copy and send it to a lucky listener. So to enter that giveaway, you can head over to our social media. It is at DNA Today Podcast on all platforms. Our most popular platforms to enter giveaways is Instagram, LinkedIn. Um, I would say that's where most of the entries are. Um, but yeah, definitely get your entries in so that you can win one of these signed copies from Rob. So... I've mentioned computer vision. We're going to be talking about how to use that to diagnose genetic conditions. But we got to reel it back because I remember when you said we were at a bar in New York City. And I think we came back from Governor's Island, if I remember. Yeah, That's right. It was yeah. a beautiful fall day. And you're like, hey, I want to talk to you about something. I'm going to start writing a book. And I was like, everybody else was gone. I was just like, we need to sit in a corner and talk about how you're going to write a book. I was so excited. I've never had a friend write a book. Um, if I'm wrong about that, please reach out to me, someone. Um, so you said, yeah, it's going to be about computer vision. And I think I tried to play it off. Like I knew what it was. And I was like, all right, I can't go much further in this conversation. So for people like me that haven't heard that term, can you explain what computer vision is? Um, and maybe how you explained it to me that day? Certainly. So yeah, it's a field I've been excited about since I, since before I really knew how to do it <laughs> or how to use it or, uh, you know, get into it. Um, computer vision is quite simply teaching computers to see in the same way or a, a similar analogous way that we do recognize objects with visual sensors like you know visible light cameras or, or infrared cameras or just any kind of light sensing device and make sense of it extract some higher level meaning from images image data which normally is you know like a grid of pixels or perhaps like a cube like a cubic grid of, of pixels that we call voxels huh. you see that a lot in medicine it's like when you're doing radiology of like a you know area of the body it's not a two-dimensional body so mm -hmm. <laughs> you that makes sense do ct so um those are voxels fun fact oh, i didn't know that already learning yes, 3d pixels are voxels yes um so yeah i asked the same question to some of the people who are like way deep in the uh, in the weeds, uh, folks at MIT, Dr. Ramin Hassani at MIT, I asked him, what is computer vision? Can you explain it as if you were speaking to a five-year-old? And he said, it's, yeah, teaching computers to see yeah, and, uh, and play with the world. It's not as useful to build a system that can't then turn around and do something automatically, right? Like, 
I want to be able to throw a ball to a robot. And not only does it know where the ball is going, but it's also able to catch the ball. You know? Yeah. <laughs> like, yeah. Um, so, yeah, that's that's computer vision from a, a 30,000 foot view. It's just, uh, yeah, can we train a computer to say, like, oh, this is a cat and this is a dog. This image contains a book or a microphone or both. And it can more recently go so far as to say like, oh, well, these pixels contain the microphone and these other ones contain the book. And, uh, you know, let's draw some boxes around them. Or even more sophisticated, let's draw like, you know, curves and define Make it the like a transparent image or something where you like draw around it in Photoshop. Yeah. So this has implications for medicine, mm -hmm. genetics, of course, um, for sports broadcasting, for um, every. Thing yeah. <laughs> imaginable manufacturing, you yep. know, like facial recognition is a big one that you focus on in the book. Certainly, autonomous um, vehicles. Yes. Um, yeah. Self-driving cars for those that may not realize what that is in the moment. <laughs> yes, and trucks and you know, uh, drones and whatnot. Yeah. yeah. So it's it's interesting that like you say computer vision and it's like oh it's this really niche field and area and technology and then you're like actually it's not it's like the technology itself maybe but being able to use that in so many areas of life it's it's ubiquitous in that sense and i think it and we see it becoming ubiquitous in our society and a term that i think i feel like you're ahead of the curve with talking about computer vision because you know this year in 2023 i feel like the word of the year is ai so a lot of people they now are aware of ai platforms like chat gpt like i've been using a lot um I've even used it to prepare for interviews. I surprisingly didn't for this episode. Um, it was just like, these are the questions I want to ask Rob after reading the book. Um, but it's interesting because AI, I'm thinking, you're going to have to school me on this, but I'm thinking that AI can be used to write code so that we can use computer vision. A am I kind of on the right track? That is true. So yeah, I would divide AI into, it's a broad umbrella, right? It, encompasses a lot and it kind of just encompasses what we um say it does like it's a loose term <laughs> it's a loose term but in the 60s they were like okay ai is gonna deal with vision tasks and mm -hmm. language tasks and uh, like auditory stuff like we think about our different senses and that's stuff we're trying to kind of you know replicate with ai but computer vision is just a subset of ai and I think today, yeah, the buzzword is ChatGPT. It's large language models. It's, um, yeah, it's it's generate. It's chatbots, right? It's mm -hmm. just having something that's like memorized the whole internet and up to twenty twenty one and uh, can regurgitate things intelligibly and and you can definitely use that to write code. <laughs> I've been doing that a lot this week. I, I started a new job <laughs> in uh, in data mining this week and. Uh, I am using code auto completion powered by, uh, you know, AI and large language models. Like, absolutely, you can use AI tools to speed up the development process. Okay. So if I want to build something that distinguishes between, um, you know, conditions like genetic conditions, I'm still the human doing it, but it's gonna not take as long. I'm gonna spend far less time googling the documentation of whatever programming library. I'm working in because I can just like tab to autocomplete whole sections wow. now. I just type the documentation. I say, this is a function that will accomplish this. And then like, boom, you can block like, it off to say appears. like, okay, here's the whole code. But in order to write the code, I know it needs these. And this is going to be super simple. But like it needs these five functions. So then you can go to like something like chat GPT and say, hey, write me number one function. Put it into the code. Write me the next function instead of writing each function yourself. Exactly. You it's, want to correct any of those terms? Because I probably didn't get it right. <laughs> no, I mean, it's, it's not far off. Okay, it's like all right. You, it's you get the enough. gist. Yeah. It's, it's good enough to do small chunks. You can think of them as like paragraphs okay. at a time sure. um, okay. of code. Uh, yeah, and eventually, maybe code will just not be a thing for humans to do anymore. Yeah. Maybe I it's wonder like, that. Maybe it's a bug that we have to write in like machine legible mm -hmm. language. Like, why don't we just write in human English like, or we'll plain always, language like uh, other we'll languages? We'll always be able to like have to read the code to like look at it. We may not have to have the skills to write the code at some point. We're gonna have to read it to figure out a bug or something, like you said. So it's not it's not if you're learning code, it's not like, oh well don't do that anymore. It's still a very useful skill, I would I would think so. For now For yeah. now. <laughs> we'll see where it goes. That's probably the catchphrase for today. Yeah. So 
When it comes to diagnosing genetic conditions with computer vision, I've heard of some programs like face to gene is one that I've come across and I think that you mentioned in the book. So this isn't as far as I'm aware being used in a clinical basis in a mainstream scale. So I kind of want to talk about what we would need to do to get there and pick your brain about what kind of data we would need to, let's say, supply this program and this to train the computer, like you were saying before, um, teach a computer to say, that's a dog, that's a cat. So we could say, you know, that's genetic condition A, that's genetic condition B. So when looking at giving data, what are some things you think about, like, let's say you were the project manager on this. You're like, all right, what are you going to tell your team? Like, this is the kind of data we need. How much data do we need? Like, I have no idea. Is 100 images sufficient? Do you need a million images? Like, and I'm sure the statistics around that are different of interpretation of what's good enough. But where does your mind go in terms of what kind of data we need to use to teach the computer? Yeah, so we have totally shifted paradigms from like writing rules to just training models with data, right? Like we used to say, okay, if there's a bunch of red pixels over here, mm -hmm. then maybe that's a defective you know, vial or pill on the assembly line. And now it's like, no, here's just examples we have labeled examples like here's a folder on a computer full of images of um, what's like a common hereditary condition I don't know. um <laughs> maybe not hereditary but i'm thinking something like treacher collins okay. is one that's if someone sees it in genetics we can recognize that condition so even it's though i'm not yeah like apparent. there are facial differences there so i'm not a dysmorphologist but i can recognize and say that looks like that person has treacher collins for instance okay so you get a dysmorphologist to take a bunch of images of folks with and without Treacher Collins, perhaps some other uh, conditions. Say Down syndrome. Yeah. yeah. And they put them into folders, maybe small hundreds, like 300, 400 images of each okay. uh, type, each condition. Um, what we can do then is we have vision models that are pre-trained on generic stuff. Like they know the difference between a human and you know other animals, other objects. Um, and then what we do is we fine tune it. We can just use a small handful of examples, only a few hundred examples, to get it the last step of the way to being able to tell the, the difference between Kira and Rob, or like mm -hmm. the difference between uh, Treacher Collins, someone with Treacher Collins, or, or mm -hmm. not having Treacher Collins. Um, that's called transfer learning. Transfer learning. Transfer learning, okay. yeah. That's when we take like foundation models or like large pre built models and fine tune them on something more specific. Um, it makes it a lot easier. It means you don't have to do a bunch of... You know, You're not teaching them this is a human, this is not, because it, it can already have that in the system. Yeah, it has like a sort of intuition already for generic stuff, and then fine-tuning is more use case specific. Like you can okay. Okay. distinguish yeah. between certain conditions. Like, yeah. One area of genetics that we talk about a lot on the show is racial disparities, and we've talked about how the beginning of genetics used a lot of data from people of European descent. And that has led to a lot of downstream effects of just big disparities where people that have European ancestry may get more precise information that people that are not looking at like genetic testing. So as we head into starting to use computer vision in the medical field and especially genetics, as we've been chatting about, what do we need to be aware of to avoid that? now that we're going into like this this new frontier of, of computer vision yeah so you have to find good representations for edge cases a lot of the time what's um, an edge case so that's like not the primary case like okay. uh, normally there's not a moose in the road in front of you you know like okay, <laughs> okay got um, it got it that's like an edge case uh say you have an image data set um, you want to keep it unbiased, but it's harder for you to find like tons of images of men wearing an apron and a chef hat in a kitchen. So your model ends up thinking all the guys in the kitchen with the apron and the chef hat are women. And it's mm -hmm. like, oh, we didn't get enough examples of people doing stuff that goes against like cultural stereotypes. So you have to watch out for that kind of thing. That's how an image data set can be biased. If it underrepresents some minority, and then it fails to recognize um, that edge case, where there's fewer examples of something to be found and to train on. 
Okay. So it's really, really important to have a very diverse data set so that you don't have those downstream effects of if someone's from one population versus another, that it's going to be more likely to accurate diagnose a condition based on that, which that makes sense of just giving more data, just like we do with genetic testing. We want to have lots of genomes from lots of different people from different parts of the world there. Exactly. Like there was a lot of noise online about um, detecting melanoma with uh, computer vision and how it's totally a conscious choice whether to train it on people with light skin or people with dark skin or some you know, balance of both. And of course, like the model didn't perform very well on people with dark skin because they, I shouldn't say of course, but they, for whatever reason, chose not to try to train right. it on a data set with plenty of folks with dark skin. So and interesting. When you are training a computer, can you train it like we're going to train it with one complexion first and then like a second wave so that you can build upon that? Kind of like you were saying of, OK, it can recognize like you versus a cat, but then it can get so specific to be like, this is Kira, this is Rob. Can can you kind of keep layering on that information so that it can be more accurate? Is, does that question make sense? <laughs> um, you might have a model that can tell cats versus dogs, but then it's certainly harder to train a model that can tell the difference between like, you know, a tabby cat and a, like, I don't know. A, calico cat. Yeah. Yeah. Calico cat. Sure. Siamese cat. I don't yes. know. <laughs> <laughs> um, it's more difficult because there's more nuance, like just in the same way that it would be harder for like a baby to tell the difference. You know, right. I don't know. All babies <laughs> kind of look similar. I don't know yes. if that really answers your question. but That makes sense that it's just it, it gets harder as we go more and more specific with that information. Yeah. You mentioned that like AI is hot right now, but yes. computer vision is not very hot right now. It will become, because, though. It's because, <laughs> I like, think you're a little biased, but I think. I think it's just kind of part of our, the fabric of our society now. It's kind of permeated everywhere. Like the last big quantum leaps in computer vision happened in like 2012, 2010, like around then. Um, and it's gotten incrementally better since, but it's also just gone wider. It's gone like mm -hmm. into every field and nook and cranny and traffic camera, you know. Yeah. Um, I, that doesn't really connect to the question, but. No, no, that's it. interesting, <laughs> like, that AI is such a buzzword, but then, you know, once you get into it more, like, with computer vision, like, it, it's not as buzzword level because it's so integrated, where it's, like, this AI, like, chat GPT is so new for people to be, for the main, for being a household term and, like, people just starting to use and play with it of, like, it, it launched versus with computer vision, you have different aspects that we've kind of like integrated into society, as you said. Once we've trained computer programs to be able to do this, at least like a beta level, how do you see that starting in terms of giving it data, like giving it an image for it to be able to give some information for like a possible diagnosis? How do you think that would work in terms of a healthcare provider uploading that information? What, what do you think that process would look like? So I think it's the same as any clinical tool. Like it has to go through trials. It has mm -hmm. to be validated. Like just because it has the AI buzzword attached to it doesn't mean it gets to skip like regulatory hurdles, right? Companies like Face to Gene are careful to say like on the front of their homepage, this is not a tool for making diagnoses. This is to help clinicians like get ideas about what potential diagnoses may be it's it's a it's a helper so they're very uh hands off they're very um legally careful about it because they don't want to get in hot water um, it's not that the tools aren't performant you know our radiological classification technology is at a place where it's outperforming whole boards of experienced radiologists it's just there's a lot of red tape to go through in the medical domain before a tool can just be picked up and like used in the clinic without some serious liability, right? Li liability is magnified in a clinical domain, just like it is mm -hmm. on the road. Right. It's higher stakes once we start using it in society, using it in medicine. And there's a lot of parallels to, let's say we have a new gene therapy, we have a new treatment that we're like, well, this has worked well in animals. Like, what's the next step? A clinical trial. So it would be similar to that, it sounds like, to make sure is this really 
able to identify whatever their is this able to find enough people with the condition looking at the statistics of like we want it to be able to identify 90 percent of people that have it or is it missing people so false positives false negatives i think that's something to be aware of we're not going to have lower standards just because the system is automated if anything we need higher standards like yes we yeah the the liability is still on the clinician using the tool even if they're saving time perhaps at the end of the day if something goes wrong it it comes back to the user of the tool right or the creator of the tool or some combination of both i'm sure we'll see some kind of lawsuit in the future and then we'll have to have you back on to like talk about that <laughs> and and once it's in the media and everything and there was something that you said earlier that <clears throat> i wanted to bring up of that sometimes we've seen computer vision is better at identifying something than healthcare providers are. Like you were bringing up like a biopsy or looking at slides or something like that where you're, you're saying, okay, let's look at this. What does this image look like? Um, you know, how are we categorizing these cells? Is it cancer, not cancer, what type? And for that, a lot of people like oncologists are gonna be very familiar and have seen a lot of cases once they get to a certain point in their career. But when we look in the rare disease space, which is one that we talk about a lot on DNA Today, some healthcare providers, mo I'll say most healthcare providers, are not going to meet someone with a nano rare disease or an you know, extremely rare disease multiple times in their career. So they don't have that experience. So I can see how computer vision would be very helpful in giving them like a differential diagnosis list is what we call it of like it could be one of these conditions we're kind of thinking along that list. Totally. Yeah. Having scores is where it's at rather than definitive answers. Machine learning is good at saying like, well, you know, 92% probability that it could be this. And then you make your own discernment as a professional with you know, training and uh, experience. Now. Yeah. But yeah, there's kind of no formal feedback system in place for people, um, for healthcare providers, as far as diagnoses, like lots of people are misdiagnosed every year. And computer vision has the potential to help with that certainly i think a combination of veteran you know healthcare folks or just well-trained folks and these emerging technologies mm -hmm. are the best combination like not replacing but augmenting just like in so many fields right like we want to supercharge you know human intellect uh, rather than like put everyone out of a job right right <laughs> to have yeah to use more tools and i think that's applies to a lot of ai um, of writers being able to use AI as a tool to enhance their writing or to cut back on some legwork and things like that. So I think using it more as a tool and it's not replacing healthcare providers is a really good point with that. And I mean, I think that brings up a good point of like how this could be an advantage to using, to diagnosing people in a traditional sense of like, okay, we're gonna look and you know measure certain things. Cause computer vision, I imagine, may be able to measure like the distance between the eyes is one that we look at. Um, where the ears are on the head. Is it rotated differently? Is it lower on someone's head? Um, so there's other things that I imagine that a computer could could measure that. Would it be able to give us like a distance or more would just be relative compared to other photos? That's a great question because the predominant paradigm right now is using deep learning, which is this convoluted kind of feedback loop of derivatives. And, you know, it's very opaque and hard to kind of deconstruct and say like, ah, this is why it gave that score. So that doesn't work in a lot of contexts where you have to explain stuff to people. You have to say, this is why your credit score is so bad. Like, <laughs> <laughs> yes. um, this is why, you know, we think you have, you know, N condition. Um, so there's a big effort to simplify, to make simpler, more pared down models that still perform very well. Because if, you know, it's like, it's like having a piano with 10 keys instead of one with like 500 keys, you know, it's like how, what note is that? <laughs> like yeah. what, what sound, which notes, which keys are we pushing on to make the thing happen? Um, that's kind of a hand wavy explanation. But, yeah, no, that makes um, sense. So certainly models can be trained to do specific things like measure the distance between the eyes, make some estimation on like a scalar value, like, you know, 
some continuous value, whatever, 50 centimeters, like okay. 60 centimeters. That would be a specialized tool that someone would have to build just for that. And then you'd have to build another tool to say like, oh, how far have we deviated the year from? And then you could take those and combine them. Okay. You know, so it would need to be like, a, a pretty robust program to do everything that I want it to do of what we've been talking about of like, okay, I want it to do this, this, and this. Well, yeah, these like kind of black box models, we said the opaque, opaque, like hard to dig into models. Sometimes they're really good, right? We just feed them a lot of data and we don't know why, but they, we don't know what areas they're focusing on exactly or what it is about the images we're feeding into it, but they are accurate. Like they're giving the correct labels on the data set where we're, we know what the ground truth is. And so people are often tempted to just use that even though they can't explain it. It's like Right, <laughs> which is a little scary because it's like then we're using something that we don't fully understand. Like that worries me. Yeah, it's only appropriate for some contexts. Mm -hmm. And medicine is probably not one of them. Yeah, right? probably not. Yeah, I don't think so. So explainable AI, mm -hmm. is, uh, we're, there's a big push for that right yeah. now. And that's, that's where it's at. <laughs> So we've highlighted advantages, some disadvantages. Anything else to add? Also, like we've referenced different areas of healthcare, but anything else to add in terms of concerns you have? What healthcare providers and spanning out just medical professionals, anyone that has to do with healthcare, what they should be mindful of as we start using these tools, which could be tomorrow, could be in years, a decade. But what do we need to consider, like if you were in the healthcare field with all of your experience with data sets and, you know, digital post-production, I mean, you just so many different experiences with digital fields. What are you worried about? What are you excited about? Final thoughts. In the context of medicine, I feel like there's a risk to not embracing certain technologies. Like if you have something that can analyze someone's blood flow with x-rays and it w works like only 200 times faster than the previous traditional approach and it's totally safe and accurate and it's gorgeous and perfect like we there's there's the kind of FOMO or like opportunity costs to not using tools so and the healthcare world is slow moving sometimes it's there is a lot of bureaucracy even beyond um, regulation there's like the internal systems at hospitals that are like kind of crawling and you know byzantine so it's it can be slow so that's one challenge is like we got to pick up the pace of healthcare and that's you know that's a gargantuan task <laughs> it is like emr was one giant leap i think for medicine and then integrating ai into emrs i think will be very interesting uh, electronic medical records for those that aren't familiar with the term Yes, I don't think computer vision is going to crack the problem of reading chicken scratch from doctor's handwriting. Let's um, hope, though. I don't know. <laughs> I mean, I I would hope so, because sometimes I'm trying to decipher and I'm like, really don't know what these letters are. What's the context? No, if yeah. a human can't do it, then the algorithm. All right. can, as far as written language, as far as I know. Um, you so far, that's <laughs> my only disappointment of what I'm learning. Other things I'm concerned about, but that's just a straight up disappointment. <laughs> mm, yeah, no, the handwriting might have to just go in favor of typed out. I think uh, it's going to be important to have people in power who know about this stuff or have it on their radar and have people who know about this stuff so that we can vote for them and uh, yes. they represent us well. Right. Um, yeah, we see good sense regulations going into place in Boston for like on the surveillance front. The ACLU of, of Massachusetts is kind of spearheading some really nice efforts to because like it, we do want to use these technologies to like catch the bad guys and mm -hmm. reduce crime, but also not create like a surveillance state. And I think there are analogs in medicine like we want to be able to use this stuff to get the benefit of it because it's cool and when it works, it can speed us up a lot and reduce misdiagnoses and um, you know, make people feel more connected to their healthcare providers because we're spending more time just like making eye contact and right. talking and yeah. Um, but then we, yeah, we must be careful. <laughs> we yes. must uh, not multiply biases. We must not multiply errors. We can't you know, buy into things that aren't proven because it's a sensitive domain. Yeah, and I think a lot with 
what we started with talking at the top of the episode is really looking at what data we're putting in to train these systems and starting from like that square one of making sure that that is seeing diverse populations there and that we're really giving it good data because there's this phrase that I'm sure you've heard like, you know, good data in, good data out, bad data in, bad data out kind of phrase. So we wanna make sure that we're really cultivating really good data so that we can get accurate information, especially when it comes to diagnosing genetic conditions. And yeah. So thank you so much for coming on the show, Rob. You wrote a really awesome book. And I also appreciate that it's an easy read. It did not feel like I was reading a textbook, which sometimes happens with like a nonfiction book, but it felt like I was just kind of sitting and just hearing your thoughts. Um, but just reading them instead. So really cool book. Um, please check it out, The Spring of Sight. And don't forget to enter our giveaway at DNA Today Podcast on all social media platforms. I recommend entering on our Instagram and LinkedIn. Those are some of the most popular places to enter. It's such a good book. And he references genetics quite a bit, which is why he came on the show today. Um, and his partner's a genetic counselor. So for genetic counselors listening and watching, um, he really has understood and seen us struggle through grad school, the ups, the downs, and all of that, and now kind of in our careers. So um, it is cool how much he references genetic counseling specifically. So thank you so much, Rob. This was so fun. I was really looking forward to doing this. Thank you so much for having me on, Kira. It's been a pleasure. The genes of you and me, the genes of you and me, are all made of DNA. We're all made of the same chemical DNA. We're all made of Thanks for watching DNA Today. To access all of our episodes, head over to dnatoday.com. We also have a lot of bonus content on there that you can enjoy. If you have any questions, comments, suggestions, guest pitches, you name it, send them in to info at dnatoday.com. We'd also really appreciate if you could take a moment to rate and review the podcast on Apple, Spotify, wherever you listen to the show. It really helps more nerds like yourself find the show. Also, if you like giveaways and other ways to connect with us, I recommend following us on social. We're at DNA Today Podcast. We also have a Patreon if you want to be the most level involved in the show. That's also at DNA Today Podcast. Thank you so much for listening and watching. Join us next time to learn and discover new advances in the world of genetics.